Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to uh, October. That's incredible. It is October 13th, 2014. And real quick, just because I need it, let's just take one great big breath in and one big breath out. Because I don't know about you guys, but the last six weeks has been a whirlwind. And I'm thankful for today. And for everybody who's here with us, we have um, a presentation. Actually, Carrie Strait is joining us again. She came in May, and she talked uh, with Ingrid uh, Van Anroy, and they talked about physical therapy and occupational therapy, but she talked about the Big and Loud program. So we're really excited to have her back today. She is with Gentiva Home Health um, Hospice and... House calls. And house calls. And uh, she's going to talk today about tools to aid with daily living. And she's got a lot of different things to uh, show us, talk about. We're going to do what we normally do. We're going to have our presentation. If you have questions, remember them. Because at the end, um, we have a couple other guests that uh, Carrie's going to introduce that's going to talk about where you can find these things that she's talking about and funding. Um, but uh, keep your questions till the end, and we will go around to all of our uh, joining sites today. Hello, everybody, Montana, Alaska, Idaho, Oregon. Hopefully you're all there today. And we'll go through those questions, and we're good. Thank you for joining us. Here you go, Carrie. All right, thanks. Yeah, so I hope you aren't all sick of me, but it was May, so I gave you a little break. But um, yeah, I'm happy to be here again. I am an OT, like Cindy said. I graduated actually from Eastern Washington University in 2002, and I've been an OT in the Spokane area for 12 years. Actually started my career here at St. Luke's Rehab, so it's kind of fun to be back. Um, and I brought with me today uh, some representatives from Norco Inc., uh, Elijah and Heath. And Heath is a ATP, right? Yes. Assistive Technology professional. So um, any of the power mobility and um, more durable medical equipment needs you might have, I've brought a vendor um, that actually services a, a lot of the region that is covered with this telehealth. So uh, they'll be here as our experts in kind of navigating all the insurance requirements and funding options for some of the equipment that we'll talk about today. So. So some of the things that I'd like to cover today, it's a huge topic. Um, everybody is so individual. Uh, people may be at different stages of their disease. So it's a huge topic to cover, but I wanted to just discuss some of the basic um, various ADLs or activities of daily living, if you're not familiar with that term, um, that can be impacted by Parkinson's disease. And I, I want to cover just some of the equipment. A lot of this is things that, I, that I've picked up along the way in my career and at thrift shops and um, as I've gone through and practicing with people with Parkinson's that have, I've found very helpful in their homes. And now being a home health occupational therapist, we get to kind of put it into practice where the rubber meets the road and you're you know, going about your day-to-day -day routine. Um, so we'll talk about some of the various pieces of equipment that are available and where you can get equipment. Uh, like I've already mentioned, Norco, there's lots of vendors um, probably in your communities, but I also mentioned thrift shops, uh, churches. So we'll go through some of the options where you can begin to look for things if you're finding that um, there might be something that you're interested in trying in your own home. And then what kind of financial support is available because um, it adds up and things can get quite expensive quite fast. So you want to put your money where it's, where it's um, needed. So and there is some help available. <laughs> so um, just to review, because you can't really talk about activities of daily living without really um, acknowledging some of the symptoms that people experience with Parkinson's disease and, and the way that those impact their ADLs. So uh, tremor, obviously, um, a lot of times it'll start on one side of the body, um, but people can be uh, affected by tremor in, in various extremities at various degrees. So dyskinesia, that's some of the extra movement. It's often a side effect of one of the main treatments of Parkinson's, which is your carbidopa levodopa or your Cinemet. And you can then have this secondary effect of having some extra movements um, that can affect balance and affect your ability to uh, manipulate objects or, or participate in your ADLs. Uh, the slowness or the bradykinesia, the slowness of movement, um, can be very frustrating for uh, the person with Parkinson's and also the caregiver, uh, especially in time constraints when you're trying to get activities done throughout the day. 
um, hypokinesias, which is the lack of movement. So that's trouble, you know, initiating movement or some of those freezing episodes some people experience. Um, some of the postural instability, and a lot of that has to do with um, a lot of the posturing you see with Parkinson's kind of stooped over, forward, flexed, um, can affect your center of gravity, can affect your balance when you're engaging in your activities. And then rigidity, so some of the stiffness and tightness that people feel um, in their joints. So uh, occupational therapy, it's really kind of a horrible name for what we do, but... Um, if you consider an occupation, anything you do throughout your day that occupies your time. So for some people, that is just waking up in the morning, getting dressed, doing their shower, um, getting their teeth brushed, uh, just their basic um, daily self-care activities. Uh, for some people, you, you may be accessing the community for work, uh, volunteer activities. Some people may have children in the home that they're caring for or pets. All of those things are activities of daily living. I'm sure you guys could name a few others. Um, but leisure pursuits, very important, just making sure that you can engage in activities that are meaningful to your day. Um, so all the different um, areas. So I just wanted to just explain that a bit more if that is a newer term for some people. So um, obviously with Parkinson's disease, we want to maintain function as long as possible. And, you know, the challenge then becomes a challenge sometimes to the care partners to don't, don't over-assist, um, allow the time that's needed for uh, somebody to engage and, and be successful with managing their ADLs in a safe manner. Um, the, it's easy when you see somebody struggling, I, I myself, when you see somebody that might be struggling with an activity is to just jump in and, and help. But... Um, sometimes just providing a cue or just some um, tactile support can just be all that's needed and that person can then continue on that with their activity. So kind of um, avoid, the hesit or avoid the tendency to just jump in and take over because it's easier uh, because it's important that people maintain as the highest level of independence as possible. Um, one way to do that is to maintain a healthy activity level. I wouldn't be doing any service if I didn't talk a little bit about the importance of exercise with your Parkinson's disease. Um, if you were <laughs> at the May meeting, you heard me speak a bit about some of the different programs that are available. But um, exercise can be, for some people, just the act of getting dressed and doing their shower in the morning. So me, you know, allowing somebody to engage in that activity level um, and it helps to maintain flexibility, stretching, range of motion, strength. But um, exercise at any level is protective. And it's kind of exciting in the Spokane area. Um, I don't think Cindy mentioned it, but the pet Pedaling for Parkinson's, which is a national program, which I believe started in Chicago, has come to the Spokane area. And it actually started today. So we might have a few absent members because the class is actually going on right now. But um, it's a free class that's available at the Y for people with Parkinson's. It's a eight to 10 week program, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for an hour. And, and if you were at the May meeting, you heard that the amount of exercise, the length of exercise, the intensity of the exercise all matter. So it's a really great program for those of you that are out in the community and able to get to the downtown Y. That's the only location that's offering it right now, but pretty exciting and hopefully more opportunities to come in our community to just kind of help people maintain a healthy activity level um, because then that does carry over into their other activities. So, and the reason it's important to maintain activity, to not over assist, is because there's a lot of research on the effects of depression and ADL and your quality of life. And unfortunately, um, you know, a lot of the research shows that depression is seen in higher incidences with folks with Parkinson's than in, in other neurological disease processes. Uh, one study, I think, quoted up to 42% of people. Not really sure that, you know, number of people that they were looking at. But I will say from my own experience that depression can, can greatly impact somebody's ability to initiate, engage, um, maintain um, activity in their, uh, during their day because they just, on top of some of the other motor symptoms they may be experiencing, just don't feel like they have the gumption to, to do it as well. So, um it may be linked with ADL impairment. Um, you know, nobody's willing to say that, but I think from experience, you 
uh, I, I've seen that that can certainly be the case because of, of the things we talked about. Um, when there's slowness already of motor movement, depression also can affect, you know, the speed and the processing cognitively. So, you know, if I would encourage you to have a conversation with your doctor, um, if you've noticed that in yourself or in your, if you're a care partner um, caring for somebody with Parkinson's, to talk about depression because I find that it's very undertreated with Parkinson's disease and that can make a big impact on, on your ability then to kind of carry out some of the other activities that you may want to be doing. So be proactive is the message with, um, that I want to kind of share with you today as we're looking at equipment. Um, you want to adapt or change your routines before the disease progresses. Unfortunately, we know enough about Parkinson's to know that it is a progressive disease and things do change. So you kind of want to stay ahead of the disease sometimes. If you're looking at some pieces of equipment, um, you want to try and extend your lens into a longer period of time, just kind of looking ahead to where things might be so that you're getting the right piece of equipment, not only for today, but for tomorrow. Um, because like I said, it adds up, it gets quite expensive. So um, you don't want to make difficult changes um, or it's difficult, excuse me, to make changes for people don't want to do that until there's a problem. So it's hard to be proactive and kind of forward thinking and, and make some changes to your routine. Um, if you started to kind of hand things over to your care partner that um, just because they're challenging, maybe take that back and start engaging more in those activities so that you can um, stay ahead of and maintain an activity level that, you know, um, this will eventually maybe become more and more difficult. So the more you can engage in that, the, the easier we're hoping it would be down the road. Uh, another kind of proactive thought is to aim for big movement, <laughs> not just because of LSVT big, but in general, um, things become slow and small with Parkinson's for a lot of folks. So aim for big movement, not fast. A lot of times I hear um, caregivers cue their loved one by saying, hurry up, hurry up. and um, because things are taking so long. Well, instead of hurry up, maybe try, you know, reach big and get your arm in that shirt or take a big step because some of those pressure cues that we give because the constraints and the pressures of our day can actually trigger freezing and actually make things more difficult for people. So just kind of watching um, how you're cueing people if you are assisting or how you're cueing yourself if you're trying to, you know, use some self-talk to get through an activity. Uh, minimizing fatigue. So fatigue is, is a big issue for a lot of folks. Um, up to a third of individuals complain of fatigue, and I would say it's even higher than that, um, just in my experience. So just feeling like you have the energy to even manage all your activities is, is a challenge. So um, really pace yourself, try and break tasks up, prioritize what you need to do for that day. Nobody likes to be limited, uh, so I and myself included. So that can be a really difficult thing to put in practice, but I'd encourage you to look at some of those pacing techniques and, and really trying to minimize your fatigue level um, throughout your day and then throughout your week um, and see if that makes a difference. Uh, make, you know, watching your medication times, trying to do harder tasks when you are on with your medications. I don't know if any of you keep a medication diary. Sometimes that's helpful because it can be um, there can be patterns in, in, you know, when you take your medications and when you have those on and off times, trying to schedule activities uh, during those on times with your medications. And, and with that, so then taking your medications consistently and at the same time each day is really important. Um, a lot of you are out and about today. I don't know if you have a med dose while you're out. I uh, you see a lot of people have those traveling med pill boxes. They're great. Um, they even make med boxes in, for the home that have timers on them because things come up and your routine gets muddled and so um, where some days you're right on, other days it might be more difficult to kind of keep that schedule. So um, I have people that set their alarms on their cell phones and that's a nice cue for them. Oh, yep, it's time for my next dose. So just staying on and regular with your medication routine. So then you can really identify with your neurologist if there's actually been some changes in the disease itself and it's not just a, a medication issue where you're not taking your meds when you need to. Um, so you can kind of monitor at your disease process in general. So that's very important. 
So before I talk about actual equipment, I want to talk about, so here are some ways to be proactive and kind of adapt. So a lot of people have an issue with, they call it retropulsion, so that tendency to fall backwards or have difficulty catching your balance when you're, when you're going in a backward motion. So I, I try to proactively work with my patients on using a Tai Chi stance. So you have one foot back behind the other and at a 45 degree angle, one foot ahead. I've got a wider base of support to go back or forth if I'm, you know, it gives me just widening your base of support more so than just spreading your feet apart wider because that doesn't give me any more backward um, support. So that's, uh, I couldn't find a great picture, but he's actually in, in Tai Chi. If, if that's another great exercise option for you guys, <laughs> going back to the previous slide. But um, just using that stance, so when, when people are emptying the dishwasher, I try to get them in this stance, or loading and unloading um, the washing machine, or getting clothes out of the closet. Anytime there's that backward motion, just changing your stance. You probably can't see my feet, but <laughs> um, the picture kind of demonstrates for the rest of you off, that are off-site, um, but basically widening your base of support. Um, providing more hand support. So a lot of times when I go into people's homes, I'll recommend a grab bar by the back door because there's a screen that they have to open out. And just that backward step, if people don't have the ability or if they're in the middle of a freezing episode and they're going to open their door and their weight is going backwards, you know, just having hand support then will help them catch, you know, catch themselves if they can't get that step back to catch themselves. So doors that pull open if it's possible or if you would consider putting a grab bar there, that is, has been very helpful for a lot of people. Um, and then if you are in a you know, congregate uh, living situation, like you're in assisted living or, or a place that maybe um, even going out in the community, uh, it doesn't have to be where you live, um, but a place that you visit frequently, they have those automatic closing doors that are on a spring. Sometimes um, reducing the tension on those can be helpful uh, I'm not sure many grocery stores or stores would be willing to do that just for one person, but maybe if it's become an issue um, it, it, and they're willing to make that modification, it's a, it's a reasonable request. But reducing the tension on some of those um, spring-loaded spring doors is really helpful for people. Sitting when dressing, again, I, um, you want to maintain ac activity as long as possible, and some people have gotten stand, dressed standing up for their whole life, and now you know, that's the, what they want to maintain. Um, I have to put in the, uh, this, the, the qualifier that it should be safe. So sometimes just sitting down, you're still getting yourself dressed, but sitting down it might be quite safer, uh, especially with toileting for some of the gentlemen. Um, that's a, a hard adjustment for some people, uh, but just sitting to toilet um, sometimes becomes a, a safer manner to, to get that done. Um, and then also putting, you know, obviously looking around your home and, and spaces that you are accessing frequently, rearranging those spaces. So refrigerators, cupboards in the kitchen, bathroom spaces. I, I see a lot of people that keep things, you know, under the sink on that back <laughs> bottom shelf. And then there's a drawer that's, you know, half full. So just kind of moving things up where it's safer and easier for people to access. Really simple, easy modifications um, and adaptations that you can kind of put into place today, um, but that's that's something to consider. So now we're kind of getting into the nitty gritty of those different ADLs. So looking at personal hygiene, um, a, a lot of these are not real cutting edge. You guys probably uh, are aware of a lot of these or, or even using them yourselves, but if you're not, just kind of considering some ways to make some of those activities easier with some of the motor symptoms you might be experiencing. Um, they do sell a lot of things with suction cut brushes if, if you're finding you're having a hard time with tremor or holding on to, to objects, especially with dentures, I find those are so expensive. Um, so people are very cautious, well then that can cause an increase in you know, some freezing or, or tremor because of the anxiety around managing some of those activities. So consider op you know, options that might have suction cups that you can put on the countertop or in the sink. I often tell people to even just put a washcloth down in the bottom of the sink when they're washing their teeth so that if they do drop them, you're not going to chip something. Um, maybe your dentist has also recommended that or dentures. But um, built-up handles, uh, especially if you're having some rigidity or difficulty grasping, we use a lot of um, built-up foam. This is an, an item um, that we use in therapy. 
there's different uh, grades. You can get this in the Salmon's Preston, which I believe they're Patterson Medical now uh, catalogs, and they do sell um, different styles and, and widths of built-up foam. Again, with a fatigue issue or if you, you have somebody that's having a difficulty coordinating, you know, raising their arm, I have people sit down for grooming or hygiene tasks, sit down at the sink and actually prop their arm on the counter to then, you know, comb their hair or brush their teeth so they're getting some rest and, and not having to deal with then the fatigue and tremor of managing that activity. So. With eating and writing, it's <laughs> kind of clump those together because hand-based activities. Um, using weighted items has been helpful for people with tremor. Um, they, we have a number of options of built-up utensils, but they're very medical looking. And when you go out to eat, some people have a hard time um, wanting to take their built-up weighted utensils with them. There's a really great company called Keatlery, and it's a I did, that's not a typo. It's actually capital K, capital E. Um, I may not be saying it right, but they they actually have a, a weighted utensils that actually look like regular, you, you know, just metal all the way down. They're very nice looking utensils. Um, I think they run for around like ten dollars a piece, so not much more than than something like this, but. Um, People have been more willing to go for that style rather than the real medical looking. But uh, the, and then the poppin pen was something I actually found on the Essential Tremor um, organization website, and it's a weighted pen um, that uh, a lot of people. I've not actually used one myself, but um, just going off of reports, um, have uh, have really found to be useful when they're writing. I know that um, there's samples at the PRC in our. Uh, for the Azelect pens, you know, the ones that kind of cup on your finger. Um, the top one is called a steady writer, and that's actually one that it's got a wide triangular base that you just set on the paper and then have to move, you know, kind of use your whole arm. That's been helpful for people, um, especially with some pretty significant tremors. Um, and I did bring some wrist weights. I actually just picked these up at TJ Maxx. It's just a one-pound weight that sometimes just by adding weight to your extremity, not actually the utensil itself, has helped people because their tremor may originate, you know, higher up in the arm, not necessarily in the hand. So wherever you need to kind of give a little bit more reinforcement to the joint, sometimes just adding weight to your arm um, can help calm um, if tremor is an issue for you. So just using ankle or wrist weights sometimes is handy. So there are different um, options for swivel spoons. You can angle utensils, and for angled utensils, I actually just tell people to go to. Goodwill or a thrift shop and buy cheap utensils that you don't mind bending and have those on hand at home. So you can just use a full hand grasp. You don't have to worry about turning your wrist. If that's difficult, you just bring the food right to your mouth. So pizza cutters, rocker knives for cutting. If, you know, people find, uh, find it difficult to actually cut food, um, those are nice options. I did bring a little sample of Dysum. This, again, is another therapy item, but you can get the idea. You here will actually be able to touch it so you can see. It's a little bit different than just some of the, the contact paper you would find at the store. So, But um, this does help stabilize bowls, cups, um, provides a nice friction uh, surface for um, people when they're eating, especially if they're having trouble uh, scooping you know, and coordinating all those different aspects of self-feeding. This is a plate guard. If you haven't seen one, it just has some hooks that just clip onto your plate so then you can kind of scoop the food up into the guard um, if scooping is difficult for you, um, which has been handy. And then um, I don't know if you guys have seen a nosy cup, but this is an option. It obviously doesn't hold a lot of liquid, but uh, basically what you do is if you have a hard time, um, because a lot of people have a very fixed posture, especially at later stages, um, if you're having difficulty with some mobility and getting extension in your neck, you can actually um, tip the cup, you know, to get a drink as opposed, otherwise it would hit the bridge of your nose and you wouldn't be able to get much liquid. Some people compensate by using straws, which is great. So, but this, um, they do make cups or you can kind of modify some cups if you think it's a good idea to just cut out a space for the nose and that's called a nosy cup. So then cups with lids and, and straws and, and wider bases, obviously, um, 
because just even setting down and picking picking up um, gives you a wider base for not spilling. I had a couple notes that I forgot to mention with the eating and writing. Um, just making sure you have really good lighting, uh, just like all the you know other muscles and, and movements in our body with Parkinson's disease, our eye muscles can be affected. So even tracking, um, focusing, um, seeing contrast, it becomes more difficult. So having good lighting and optimally, if you're doing a task where you want to write or, or read or do something, having the light back behind your shoulder and shining down on where whatever it is you're working on is optimal. Um, and then using high contrast. So whether you have a placemat or a Dyson or something that kind of creates good contrast with your plates and that's actually very helpful. So for toileting, um, there's different rails uh, available. Um, toilets are often, in a lot of homes I go in, there is no, no place for a grab bar by the toilet a lot of times. So um, they do have options where there's grab bars that will flip down from the wall, which are really handy. You'll see them actually at a lot of assisted living facilities. Um, great option for a lot of people. They really like having something that they can flip down and, and get out of the way when they're managing that transfer. Um, it's, it's a nice option. Otherwise, there are in the top corner there, you can see that's a toilet safety frame. I chose that model specifically because I do not like the ones that have legs that go down on the floor because then that becomes a tripping hazard for people when they're going in and out of their bathroom space. They're typically not large spaces in bathrooms, so you know you want to keep as much off the floor as you can. So that's a style of um, it's called toilet safety frame. And you can kind of see on the table here I have a raised toilet seat with armrests. So if you're also needing a raised surface, that's an option. I, I know that a lot of people kind of shy away from a uh, raised toilet seat like this just because they don't like cleaning it. Uh, it's one extra thing to kind of clean sometimes. And for some people, this space, it takes away uh, the space of the opening for the actual task of toileting. So um, it's not something you can actually trial and then say you didn't like it. They won't take the equipment back. So um, it's, but it's, you know, just show you an option. It works really well for a lot of people. I just want to speak to some of those issues that people have had with it. Um, sometimes people will just opt for replacing a toilet with a higher seat itself and then looking at some kind of a bar or safety frame. Uh, depending on what your budget is, though, you know, those are some options. There is, you know, obviously bedside commodes, um, bedside urinals for men and women. I haven't had very many women willing to try those. But nighttime toileting can, can be an issue for some people. Um, you know, the frequency of having to get up and then being very stiff from not moving while you're sleeping. Um, nighttime toileting can be kind of problematic for people. So there are urinal options for the bedside for both men and women. And that's kind of a horrible picture with the background. This is the female one. It has a larger um, opening, a, a cup to accommodate uh, females. So for hygiene purposes, you know, what, moist wipes are helpful. Using some kind of a water bidet um, have become more popular for some people if, if the actual act of hygiene is difficult. Um, and then obviously clothing management. These are, you can't quite see from the picture, but they are uh, Velcro pants. And that, those are offered through a company out of Seattle called Buck and Buck Clothing. Um, you're nodding your head, Cindy, if you guys kind of... From Good. There's some clothing options. They're nice looking clothing. It's not medical looking. Um, they also have elastic waistbands, so it makes it much easier for people to manage for their um, toileting. Uh, then again, I have a, a patient that I'm working with right now who, no matter what you say, he's not going to stop wearing overalls, and that's just, you know, you got to work with what you, what you want. You have a preference, and you have a style, and so, you know, um, just knowing that there is some options um, to make that easier is helpful, so. So for dressing, um, the... These are the, I mentioned at the bottom here, Buck and Buck, and then Magna Ready, that's actually magnetized clothing. And they're really nice dress shirts. They're nice looking clothes for men and women. It doesn't have to look medical. 
and adapted. It's they're very nice, and that it makes it easier for people that might have difficulty managing their fasteners. But um, maybe for people, uh, might be in the later stages where you know just all of the steps of getting dressed become difficult. I often recommend that people just set out clothing in the order it needs to be put on the night before. So that's all ready to go. It takes one le one less step out of your morning. I guess you're adding it to your night, but <laughs> um, sometimes that's helpful in, in just kind of making you know things run smoother. Um, waiting 45 minutes till after you take your morning meds before dressing sometimes is helpful for some people. Just kind of, again, timing your activities, especially if it's a difficult task for you when your medications might be um, more beneficial and help out. If buttoning is therapeutic. As an OT, I'll tell you that maintaining as much fine motor coordination as you can is there is important, but there is um, obviously button hooks and different devices for managing um, clothing if that is your preference. This uh, picture here is a picture of a zipper pull. You can buy different styles of zipper pulls or you can adapt it yourself. I've had people just throw a paper clip on their zipper just to give a little more uh, length to hold on to and it works great. So you don't have to get anything fancy, but just um, some of those modifications are helpful. As far as the bathing, um, increasing safe hand support. I, I don't recommend suction cup grab bars for my people that I work with that have Parkinson's disease. Uh, just because um, inevitably the amount of hand support that's needed is different from day to day and I just the suction cup bars are um, I, I think for long term you just want to maybe invest in a safer option where it's actually secured into the wall um, so just you have pictures of different grab bars I, I didn't bring a clamp on bar but there is a, a style of a bar if you have a bathtub that just clamps onto the edge of your tub that gives you hand support for getting in and out Cindy has one at the PRC here in Spokane. So if you're interested in seeing one, um, that's helpful. Um, again, just there's different companies that will cut out your bathtub if that's your option. Obviously, there's bath benches. Often rotation becomes difficult. Ro rotating and pivoting is a very difficult movement for a lot of people with Parkinson's. So they make bath chairs where, you know, you, you have a... a a slide model where you sit on the seat and it slides in it will rotate out for getting in and out of the tub um, depending on how your bathroom set up looking at a, an option that would accommodate both toileting and bathing might be helpful for some of you um, to consider um, but there are lots of different options to make your bathroom safe and accessible for you so uh, the the act of bathing um, sometimes requires some caregiver assistance but little things like using a terry robe for drying off or using a towel on the actual toilet seat when it's closed and sitting there to dry is, is a, a nice way to kind of manage your bathing um, and drying off so that you're safe and dry before you leave the slippery linoleum floor or tile floor, whatever you have. Um, considering removing doors because that limits the amount of space you have to get in and out of your shower. So using curtains instead of uh, re replacing doors with a curtain rod and uh, curtain might be helpful. And again, just traction for your feet. So bath mats, especially good secure ones. I use this anti-skid tape. I actually picked this up at Lowe's, but you can get it at Home Depot as well. Um, use it, you can use it on outdoor decking, but um, people have actually used it in their shower, on their shower floor. And because it's indoor, outdoor, it's, it's weather resistant, it does well in shower spaces especially if there's not too much texture to the bottom. Um, and uh, it provides a nice, secure surface for people for their feet. You can, those of you that are here can come up and feel it. It is a little rough, but actually it's you know, not too abrasive on the skin and it works quite well. So some of the modifications, if you're looking at higher end, I know um, a lot of people ask about, what about those walk-in bathtubs? They're amazing. You can look at Planet or Bath Planet, Rebath. There's local contractors. Those work really well for a lot of people, but depending on your budget and your space, you know, it, it might be something um, you want to look at. I didn't include any of that today, um, but thought I'd make mention of that.
Okay. Um, on a side note, I have Carrie's uh, PowerPoint on my computer, and if there's slides that you would like to request, um, like the one that said what's covered and what's paid out of pocket or any of those, let me know, and I can get that to you later. Uh, as usual, we're going to go around to all of the sites that have checked in today. Um, at this time, uh, when, you, when I call out your site, go ahead and unmute. Let us know how many people are attending today and any questions that you have and we'll start with Anchorage and as you unmute and if there's something that happens and I skip you uh, holler at the end and we'll come back and make sure we get your questions Anchorage Alaska Providence Medical Center Billings Montana Yes, great program. I really learned a lot, but I have a question. I had understood that some years ago there was a limit on, like if you bought, had uh, aid in buying a walker, there was a three-year wait. If you needed a wheelchair within a three-year period, you were kind of out of luck until a certain period of time had passed from making that initial purchase. Is that still holding? That would be correct. And actually, it's actually uh, five years. Uh, Medicare and most insurance has followed this guideline that all uh, durable medical equipment should have a five-year reasonable loot, uh, use. Uh, so that is one thing to know, especially if you are looking at a walker. Um, a lot of times people start out with a front-wheel walker and then a couple years later go, hey, I need that four-wheel walker. So again, looking ahead, wondering, hey, in the next five years, am I maybe going to want that bigger, nicer walker? Uh, definitely helps you be able to save that benefit to what you're actually going to be uh, using it for, for the higher item. And in some cases, I we've worked especially with some of the um, more ne progressive neurological conditions. If there's a change in condition, then we can work around that um, with if it's before that five-year window. So, but there has to be a pretty significant change in condition, you know, to qualify that. But yeah. so it's not a real black and white answer always, I guess. But yeah, the, there is the five-year. Five years unless Statute. there's a change of condition. Unless there's might. a change of condition. Thank you for your question. Do you have any more in Billings? We have three in attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Chuila, Providence, St. Joseph. And some of our places have, um, not everybody gets to stay as long. Like today, we had join people that joined us. Thank you for everybody who came after pedaling for Parkinson's. Yeah. <laughs> um, Clarkston, Tri-State Memorial. We don't have any questions, but we had 10 in attendance. Thank you. And um, October 20th at, I'm not going to remember the name, it's the Rooster something. Rooster, yeah, Rooster's Landing. Thank you, Rooster's Landing. Um, if you're near Clarkston or going to be near Clarkston on October 20th, there is a Living with uh, Parkinson's program uh, with Dr. D'Amatos. And if you would like more information, contact me at the PRC. I do have the flyer for that, but it's at Rooster's Landing. Thank you very much, Clarkston. Coeur d'Alene, Kootenai Medical Center. We had seven today, and there's no questions. Thank you very much, Coeur d'Alene. Colville, Providence, Mount Carmel. Dayton General, oh, sorry. Is that Colville? Uh, we have, yes, yeah, Colville, and we have five and no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Colville. I bet it's getting even more beautiful up there right now. <laughs> Dayton, Dayton General Hospital. We're going to jump down to Moses Lake, Samaritan Healthcare. Hi, we have 11, and we do have a question. Okay, go ahead. Cindy, this is Steve. Hi, Steve. Um, hi. As to crab bars, uh, is there some suggestions about the angle and the height and the diameter of the bar that there's um, – would be helpful to us just in general? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
height wise if you go out in the community ADA dictates scrap bars should be around 36 inches from the ground um, which I found to be actually a very appropriate height in most homes as well um, as far as diameter uh, it's really um, optimal grasp is around 32 centimeters in diameter um, or circumference so but um, everybody's hands are different that's far too large for some people to you know um, usually going with the two inch grab bars they go off of the those are recommended and looking at the finish on them so some of the painted or style that are white tend to be very slippery when wet so, um, getting something with a bit of a finish if, if slipping is an issue uh, as far as angle goes um, that is dependent on installation and where your studs are but uh, I don't know that there's a, a real um, set angle usually um, I've seen them installed either horizontally vertically or you know around the 45 yeah I found where in our case and we've used effectively the suction ones there's some pretty good ones and when you have um, fiberglass you're limited obviously oh, yeah. but I found just sort of looking at the situation and and, and there are varying diameters so it's, it's all over it's, um, hand size or grip ability or there's, there's a number of factors I don't think there's any probably had answer for that yeah no I, and that's actually a good point with a lot of the fiberglass showers there's a negative space behind it um, until you get to the wall so installing uh, traditional grab bars won't work so you're right um, uh, you know and if you've had good success with a suction cut bar I will not steer you away from it um, just uh, I guess checking each time before use that it's it is secure because I've had um, incidences where uh, the suction cup has come loose uh, during a transfer so I, I get a little leery about recommending those well, just two comments in practice uh, sure. we have a mountain home and our own home and I've taken these back and forth is make sure that the surface is clean and wet on both the suction thing and the uh, and, the, and the surface of the shower and it, it seems to help and certainly pre-testing is, is advantageous so yeah. thank you very much oh thank you excellent point yep uh, others here um, any more questions? questions thank you very much that's it thank you excellent thank you steve thank you everybody in moses lake um, Pendleton, Oregon. Well, we have two today, and we have a question. Um, there is a Parkinson's meeting, I believe, in Tri Cities on the 23rd. Is that correct? The one that um, I'm aware of on the 23rd is actually in Wenatchee, um, but I can. I can find out there might be one on the 23rd that I don't know about because that happens um, a lot uh, and I can get the information but I do know that there is one in Wenatchee on the 23rd of October so is this Sue it is okay Sue I can get the information to you um, and find out if there is one in the Tri-Cities as well thank you and then did you have a second question no, we only had two people. Okay. <laughs> well, we're glad the two people that are there are there. Because it is Columbus. And no dog. <laughs> oh, it's a dog. Because it is Columbus Day. And some places are closed. I don't know about you. I have one more left in school, and they were off on Friday. So it was kind of weird. I don't know. So thank you for being there. Uh, Port Towns and Jefferson Healthcare. Pullman Regional Hospital. There are two of us here today. Bonnie has a question for you, Cindy. Thank you. Hi, Bonnie. Hi. I talked to you about Dr. Alder, the new doctor. I can try and ask answer a question about Dr. Alder. Go ahead. Um, you said there was going to be a, a speaker on in Lewiston later on in the month. Yes, Dr. Aldred, the 20th of November, will be speaking in Lewiston. Um, and uh, I'm waiting on the official flyer for that, but he will be in the Lewiston area 
November 20th, which I think is this, the Saturday before Thanksgiving. Um, and it will be in the middle of the day. I think it's one o'clock in the afternoon. And it's going to be, if I remember right, it's also going to be at the hospital. So the, they're in the process of setting that up. But uh, November 20th, I know, is the date that they're, that they're doing it. Thank you. I, I, I'm going to be in Spokane on Thursday. You don't have to send a thank you down to me. You on this Thursday, you're going to be in Spokane? Yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to shoot for being at the PRC from noon to 4. Let me know if you're going to come by so I can make sure I stay there. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Bonnie. Okay, Tenasket, <laughs> North Valley Hospital. <laughs> Good day. There's three of us and no questions. Hello. Thank you for joining us, Tenasket. Walla Walla, Providence, St. Mary. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, this is actually Dr. Tom O'Donnell, um, physical therapist, new rehab director here. I actually stumbled in upon this meeting. And I actually do have a question in regards to... If you, if any of the hospitals offer LSVT, Becky Kimes, big training. So I have an answer to that. If you, yeah. Okay. Um, we, so I work with Gentiva Home Health, and we have quite right. a number of clinicians. And unfortunately, um, on an outpatient basis, I believe there are two practitioners in the Spokane area, but they're out of uh, clinics, not through the hospitals. But we're certainly encouraging more people to get involved and get certified so there's more options for folks. Okay. And on the second part of that, um, I am working with one of our board members who also is at Gentiva, um, who we want to do a training. We were going to try and do one in February, but it might get pushed out for April. Um, and so we're going to look at bringing a full-on LSVT big program training to Spokane. So um, my name is Cindy, and since you just kind of stumbled in on this, I, I'm the right. one. Right. I just, I just sat down like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. No, that's perfect. So I'm Cindy. I'm the director of the Parkinson's Resource Center. And if you contact me, um, actually, I'll go ahead and give our new contact information right now because we've gone through all the sites, and then we'll ask questions at Spokane's here in Spokane in just a minute. But uh, in the last... Uh, few weeks we have moved to our brand new location and so uh, the phone number for that is transitioning over but our new phone number is 443 excuse me 509 443-3361 um, that is working and on, but our old number is currently working too, just in case you call that. Um, and then I'll, my email has stayed the same. It's center at Spokane Parkinson's with the S on the end dot org. And then um, you can always find us at the website, spokaneparkinsons.org. And our new address is 613 South Washington, Suite 104, Spokane 99204. And that's a lot of information. I can repeat it later, or you can email or call me. But if you can send me your information, I will make sure that you, as soon as we have the date set, we can get that information about that training here in Spokane. Wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, and what also next month, we have a professor from EWU, dental hygienist, who's going to come and talk about um, visiting the dentist and Parkinson's and different neurological uh, diseases and disorders and how to work around some of those things that you don't necessarily think about before you're going to go to the dentist, you just think you're going to go to the dentist and they're going to do stuff to your teeth. And so next month, November, is uh, dental um, dental office visits, dental hygiene, and Parkinson's. And Spokane, do we have any questions? Spokane has 23, and we do have some questions. Um, I wanted to know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, before buying any equipment, it is good to have an occupational therapist or physical therapist to visit and see what would be the best and appropriate uh, equipment to get for your house. Mm -hmm. Now, does the Medicare pay for that evaluation, environmental evaluation? That's a great question. Um, I know through... Uh, um, 
your Medicare benefit, they will pay for home health services to come. And uh, if, if your loved one is homebound and qualifies for home services, Medicare pays for that. And that would include a physical therapy and occupational therapy assessments if they're needed and ordered by the doctor. So we need a doctor's order, um, but Medicare covers that under home care for homebound folks. What if they're not homebound? Um, there is, I have, I'll get it to Cindy. I have a home safety uh, assessment checklist that I can give to her that we often give to people to go through themselves. Um, and then um, I know that in Spokane, there, I'll have to get the name of the agency. There are some caregiver agencies that will come and do home safety assessments, but I don't believe they're therapists. I believe that they're, um, they're professionals in the community, but uh, yeah. Equipment, exactly. Yeah. I know. Yeah, you don't want to wait till you're homebound to get the equipment you need. Um, from my avenue, uh, you know, that's just the perspective I'm coming from. And, uh, you know, on the outside, for those of you that are very active in the community and, and considering equipment options. We're trying we're trying to give you information through presentations like this on what's available, but um, um, it, it does help to kind of take some measurements of the space that you have in your home if you're considering equipment and then visiting some vendors. But as far as getting an evaluation, um, that's difficult to do in your home. You could call, gosh, I'll have to, I don't have a good answer for you. I wish I did. Uh, it's definitely an, an underserved area with some of the progressive diseases because. Maybe it's a future carnival of wellness again where it's a little bit of the, we bring the equipment there and people can come in. And yeah. Something like Until that. Until it's in your future. home though too, that's yeah. the kicker because, yeah. uh, you know, you have an idea of what it looks like, but you, you know, in your space it could be very different. So, um that's why I think, you know, having a lot of the, the loan closets or um, if you can get your hands on something from other friends or churches and try it, uh, it it's not a great option and not a great solution, but, yeah. I will get that to I, S I can, Cindy I can has it. it. Okay. It. Yeah, contact information for Scottish Rite was the question in Spokane, so. Okay, uh, Hardy? Yeah, I just, I may have missed this point, but uh, is it possible, did you say, to uh, get an iPhone without any charge? Oh, no. No, I'm sorry. There are some um, applications that you can download on your smartphone. Um, yeah, but I, I not... Not for the phone itself, unfortunately. There's actually, there's amazing. There's, I don't know how many, there's like 12 speech ones yeah. now for, and there's, oh, there's a whole bunch. But it's really cool. You yeah. just have to figure out and play with which one you want. To yeah, this, so. absolutely. Carrie, you mentioned uh, uh, van versus rehab equipment. Oh, Could you expand on what the differences are there? Yes. <laughs> Heath. <laughs> Heath can. <laughs> Okay. Thank Good you. Question. Oh, it's my turn now. All right. <laughs> well, yeah, there there are a difference uh, in in the the, the uh, power wheelchair um, world here. This the the van uh, power chairs are basically your low end power chairs, where the seating system um, looks like a car seat on top of a power base. And it's, it's a great piece of equipment to uh, get in, in, in and around the home, uh, wherever you're at. Um, but it's just a basic, basic piece of equipment. Uh, it doesn't have any contoured uh, capabilities. You can't put uh, any extra stuff on it for positioning that you may need. Um, it has its purpose. It has its use. It's a great. Um, but it's just your basic uh, version of a power chair. This right here is um, considered a rehab uh, power chair, uh, and like what you're sitting in, in yourself, sir. Um, it's got the capabilities to have a different style of a back on it for positioning needs, maybe a headrest, um, different kinds of arm pads that may be needed, uh, different kinds of cushions and uh, supports 
uh, that may be needed uh, for for you or for your uh, for your loved one. Also, too, it has a capability for power options. So this uh, uh, right here is uh, called power tilt. It also has an option where the back can recline as well. Also, too, uh, the feet uh, can be raised up. So different capabilities uh, for whatever you may need. You don't have to have all three of these different options. Uh, you can have zero power options but have a rehab seat on it. This maybe got a different back, different cushion, uh, some accessories like that. So there's a whole bunch of uh, different options, different scales that you can do. But I, I'd like to go off what Carrie said earlier about if you're thinking about power, it's best to go with something rehab to start with. Because like Carrie said, you can grow, you can add things onto those rehab uh, power chairs instead of those van uh, seat style power chairs, just the basic ones. Oh yeah, yeah. And <laughs> how much are we talking about for a piece of equipment like this? Well, this type of a piece of equipment, uh, this probably setup right here is about 25000 set up right here. And that's quite a big dollar amount, quite shocking actually. We could do a lot with $25,000, but what these things do and the things that they provide, uh, and the biggest thing is independence. Uh, the biggest thing is mobility um, that these things provide. Uh, getting in and around home, actually getting to the store, go out shopping, being mobile in that way as well. Insurance companies don't like to uh, hear about that, but they know it happens, and we know that it needs to be done. Um, so the independence and, and um, mobility is, is huge with these. So you're saying that on, on Hardy's chair here, that he doesn't have those options on it. But if he needed them, those could be, this could be changed to have those options? Yes. Hmm. Windshield wipers. <laughs> 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 they haven't come up with that yet. Carrie, one more question about the uh, bed canes and bed rails. You know, I know you have there are portable bed canes that, yes. that you can get, like you have here. But now, are there any kind of devices like uh, trapeze that you don't have to attach to the wall or the ceiling? Well, the trapeze bars that I'm familiar with are um, accessories for a hospital bed. I don't. I've not seen any um, outside of ones that family members have tried to make themselves for their loved ones on their standard beds. Um, there's not, they don't manufacture them for a standard bed that I'm aware of. I just have seen the ones that are an accessory for a hospital bed. So, actually, yeah. they do. It's, okay. It's a, it's, a uh, they, it's called a freestanding trapeze. Okay. Um, and it actually just slides right underneath the head of the bed. It's got two legs. And then the bar comes up and over with the bar. Okay. So, yeah, you don't. The nice thing is you don't have to have that hospital-grade uh, bed um, that's yeah. not the greatest to look at. You can use your regular bed okay. for those freestanding. You can move it around wherever you need it as well. Yeah. Thank you, Heath. And, and another option, if you guys are looking for something you don't want to actually bolt it in somewhere, uh, you can get a floor-to-ceiling pole. I think she had a picture of it earlier there, where it basically it's just going to be tightened against the ceiling. Something that's real portable, you can move it. Um, great option for anywhere by the bed, by your couch, in the bathroom, just something that you can hold on to. You can get them with you know, a, a, a curved bar attachment to make it easier to grab onto. But those are also something that you can just tension against the ceiling and are really easy to install and move. Thank you very much. Um, so I don't have three parkies today, but I think you got a parkie last I got time. One. My boys got one. So, but uh, as always, our our parkie is our thank you. So we'll find another parkie for Elijah and and Heath. Heath sorry. Thank you so much for coming today. And um, if you have any questions that didn't get answered or you think of afterwards, um, I have all the contact here for. Carrie and Heath and Elijah and um, I have the Scottish Rite uh, contact also and again if you have anything from the PowerPoint that you want information about uh, let me know.
Thank and I will, sorry, one last thing, because I did bring an article that I meant to speak about, but we had ran out of time and now we're way over. But um, there is a, an article that I gave cop Cindy a copy of on um, Parkinson's disease barriers and facilitators to optimizing function. It was out of Rehabilitation Nursing Journal, and I gave a copy to Cindy to kind of pass out if you were interested, but it has really practical pointers, um, tricks of the trade. You know, it's, a, it's not a very long article, but it kind of talks – it speaks to the experience of not only the person with Parkinson's, but the caregiver and just kind of how that fits together sometimes. Um, and, you know, uh, I, it's a really great, well-written article. So I, I wanted to make sure you guys knew that that was available for you. Yep. And I have that on email as well. Perfect. If you request me to send it to you, I will send it to you. If <laughs> Send me an email and I'll send it back. Um, but thank you so much. We will hopefully see you all next month, November the 8th. Does that sound right? <laughs> I don't think actually that's right. November the 10th, something like that. I apologize. But, uh, oh, no, this is really important. Okay, so we just moved. Um, which we just went over that address, but in the move, m the mailing list got reset. Um, it had all been fixed as of April for all the wrong addresses and things, and it, in the move, it got reset. We'll try not to blame user, um, but uh, so some people received uh, postcards with the wrong name on them. Some people didn't receive their postcards. I think I can go back and I can fix it, but if you got a postcard with somebody else's name on it, or if you didn't receive one and they did come late this time, please gently let me know by an email or a voice uh, voicemail the correct address and what was actually on your card so I can fix that, um, and I will fix it before, um, uh, before the next mailing. The email address is center, C-E-N-T-E-R, at Spokane Parkinson's, with the S on the end, dot org. And you can find that on the website as well. But yes, just let me know, because there was a snafu in the computer between one location and another. So uh, if you didn't get them, that is why, or we'll hope that's why. Thank you so much, everyone. See you next month.